different at every p at every load that we took. Okay, and they're extremely different. Okay, so it's the same thing that we've seen before. Uh, one of the most interesting things here, um, which I'll come back to a little bit, is that the upper lobes of this one, this is where the uh, patients, uh, because of how airflow works in the lungs, you don't get as much movement of air in the upper airways, okay? And this, things that are, that are completely filled, this is where the disease usually manifests itself uh, initially, is um, uh, there's basically very little phage there that we could identify, and it's all full of herpes viruses. And we think it's because you've got so much scarring that the herpes viruses are just being constantly induced out of the tissue layers. Okay? And then if you go down and you look at the different um, uh, lobes, you get different viruses, uh, different viral communities, and, um, and for you know, the more medically inclined people, um, those viruses are including, or they, they're coding interesting things, including things like we see different places where you've got the mucoidy phenotype associated with uh, PF1, which is a phage. Um, remember the mucoidy is that, a, a version of, this, of uh, pseudomonas that like, yeah, makes a whole bunch of extra cellular polysaccharide, which we think is important for disease. The other one is the antibiotic resistance, because of course this is what everybody believes is the most important thing. So you can see that you actually just get different antibiotics. It's a resistance to uh, phenotypes based on that. Um, this is where um, uh, uh, we'll hear more about this today, because now we've got much better ways of predicting antibiotic resistance, and that's what Rob uh, S. will be talking about today. All right, so again, basically, these are the things that we've seen. Um, we see lots of, uh, uh, you know, variation. Essentially, if you put it all together, the variation is going to be associated with these uh, microbial, um, uh, with the viral fractions, okay? This is just the last example from this, is basically, um, we also see things uh, in this lung, for example, there were these cysts in this one lobe, and that was probably that there was a, actually a carcinoma going on, and of course, they don't really know that when they're doing the treatments. So this person had a lung, they had CF and they had lung cancer probably, and you can see that in the, uh, uh, in the genes, okay. Um, so when you're a CF doctor, of course, and I think you guys all realize this now, is that it's like you're treating a whole bunch of crap, right? Just trying to keep these people alive. So there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in those lungs. And this could just be a papillomavirus that doesn't normally cause cancer, but now it's all trapped in that area, right? All right, and then this is um, uh, basically to give you another fill. So these are things that came out. This is basically John Wonkili's stuff and, uh, that Yan Wei had done with um, him. And this is a, a different way of processing samples. And so uh, in some samples, you can get away with um, using a lot of DNAs. So basically all we do is filter and then DNA it and then sequence it, right? So we don't do the cesium chloride gradients. And then just do this, uh, just sequence and try to figure out bioinformatically what's going on. And what you see here is, um, there's a guy actually named Allender, uh, and he's the first person to do a lot of this, uh, this sort of approach. And you get the same answer. Basically most of the stuff there are unknowns, and, um, uh, and if you look, especially in something like the oral pharyngeal stuff, you can actually find that basically there are uh, all these viruses that we've seen before, as well as all those unknown. So we know we're looking at viruses, we just know, uh, and we can only identify a few of them. And this goes back to, remember TTVs, right? These are probably the most common human-associated viruses. We find them everywhere. Um, and if you look at uh, sick people, what you find is that the methods that we're using to detect like rhinoviruses and stuff aren't picking them up, right? So there's all these novel viruses that everybody has and um, uh, any page of population that we look into, we find new ones. And this just is kind of this. So you do a small study and you find two new HPVs, right? Does that make sense? So everywhere you look, you find new viruses right now. It's still at that level. And then this is uh, what out of Maya's. So this is just inside someone. It's 
So these are probably very much eukaryotic viruses. So what we're doing here is we're only taking blood from healthy individuals, so no evidence of viremias. Okay. And um, this is what they look like under an EM. These are like classical looking uh, human viruses. Okay. And this is, it. remember, just out of blood. This would just be like you or I. Okay. And again, most of them are unknowns, right? I mean, sometimes we find that we, you know, you see a lot of TTV, so that will push it up. But we see tons of unknowns. And then we find these guys, which are the most common. We always find a lot of herpes um, viruses. There's a lot of herpes viruses that are in your T cells and in just some of your tissue layers. So you're shedding those, it seems like, all the time. Um, and then there are these new ones, you know, like this cowpox one I think is really cool. We've never followed up on it, but we actually have a relatively piece of it. So there's a pox virus that seems to be in the healthy human population. All right, and, um, and then, yeah, this is Anella viruses, so the TTV stuff. So um, Maya's lab has actually followed up on this. These things are everywhere. So these little uh, single-stranded DNA viruses are all over the place. Right, they're totally understudied. It's crazy, right? This would, this is like amazingly diverse. It's all over the tree of life, and I've looked at. All right. Um, oh, and the caveat is that I want you to remember is that one of the reasons that we do find these so easily is because of the phi twenty nine amplification bias. All right, so there is what we know about human virium. Let me just look forward. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, I think, right? Because this is the, right. Okay, so all I want to mention, we should go through <laughs> this one a little bit more detail because this is uh, where Jer Jeremy's stuff is, right? And we've all heard Jeremy, so we don't have to actually talk about it in much detail. Um, right now, so everybody remembers the ideas of this, right? Because I want to get through this to, to ask you guys some questions. So basically the idea that you have all these uh, uh, mucosal surfaces and what we always find or what we've been finding for, for years now is that we always find this enrichment of phage on the mucosal surfaces and, um, and, and what we know now or what, we're, what, what it really looks like is that the phage are binding to the mucins, right? So that seems to be the main, uh, main interactions of these things. That isn't what actually I thought originally. I thought this would be all electrostatic, right? That these would be electrostatic interactions of the viruses with the mucins. Okay? And um, the, the paper that actually made that, uh, that like, I guess less than a year ago, really knocked us like got us thinking again is that uh, Minot and uh, from Brett Bushman's lab did ultra deep sequencing of uh, the human uh, the, the gut microbiomes and showed really nicely that these outer capsid proteins are hyper uh, that there's a lot of variation of them in our gut okay? and that really suggests that there's something specific about this association once you see their paper, then you're like, our observation made a ton of sense, right? That we've never actually been able to put together, right? And so then, um, then we went to something simple um, so that Jeremy could get it to work, and basically sucking mucus off and counting viruses. And what we find is that, uh, um, that there's a lot of uh, viruses there, right, in, on a mucosal surface. And, this gives you, just remember this rule that your phage to microbe uh, ratio is always about 10 to 1. It varies, of course, where you're going. So this would be the environment, and then this is on the equivalent mucosal surface, right? And this is what Lauren is uh, following up on and getting us a lot more data. You'll always see a lot more. And what's your average? Is it like 30 to 1 or something? Uh, yeah, 35 to 1. 35 to 1. So it's always highly enriched on these mucosal surfaces, right? Okay, and, and again, I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on this, but just remember that what this means is that um, he has a whole bunch of better experiments of this now, but basically, no mucus, you don't get phage binding. Mucus, you get a lot more phage binding. Okay? And those can uh, 
yeah, this is just where he does the same with just purified mucin, and now you've got it with DNA and with protein, right, on the plates. So we know that this is something specific about the mucin, okay? So you need mucin for the binding of the phage, okay? You also need the mucus to protect the, the underlying tissue layers, right? So it does seem to be all about this, and he's got uh, uh, knockdowns now and chemical ways of looking at this, and all of it goes together, all right? And then, uh, since these were the complicated things, this is where Rita had to do the work for it. <laughs> um, so she showed, she used flow cytometry to look at like dead things that she would challenge with, um, uh, with bacteria to show that if you have phage there, you're protected, and if you don't have phage there, they die, right? So it's, yeah, it's actually a pretty thing. All right, and then this is the thing that really came out of the Menino paper, right, is that there are these famous uh, Hawk uh, proteins, which are sitting on, this is on T4. So this is a capsid, and these are things that are sticking out. And why these are famous is because if you inject a phage into a mouse, right, this is where you get a, a massive immune responses to this, these proteins, okay? And everybody, uh, uh, had, and then lots of people have studied them, both structurally and for a lot of different reasons. Um, 